everyone. All right, so today I get the privilege of talking about something that I'm pretty passionate about. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, you probably already know that I'm super passionate about it because I tweet just so much about it. Um, and that's WebAssembly. And uh, just so I have a general idea, how many people have actually heard of WebAssembly before? Like, you may not even know what it is, but you've at least heard of it. Okay, cool, great, so the majority of the room. So, I think that WebAssembly is going to change the way that we build and think of what a web app is. And in, in, in the not too distant future, we may even stop using the word web app when we talk about an application. Just because it's really going to enable, in long term, the, the distinction between a native app and a, and a web app to be completely blur. And so, who am I? I'm, I'm Jay Phelps, and when I uh, originally was accepted to do this talk and planned it, um, I was actually a software engineer at Netflix, but this has actually changed in the last month. I uh, went off and did the startup thing with my friend Tracy uh, at a company called This Dot. And uh, what, what This Dot does is we do support, training, mentorship, software architecture, and developer relations, um, and that type of thing, which I was doing for the last couple of years anyway, um, just more organically, and so it just basically was a very natural thing. And with this dot, I'm gonna be able to do also more stuff with RxJS, which I'm very obsessed with, and uh, WebAssembly as well. So if you have any uh, interest in, in these type of things, feel free to get in touch. So let's get started. What exactly is WebAssembly, right? or AKA WASM, or WASM, depending on what part of the country you're from. Uh, it's an efficient, low-level bytecode for the web. That's how they describe it. That's how I usually describe it, because it's a very terse definition. But what does that actually mean? Well, look, let's look at efficient. What we mean by efficient is that it's fast to, to load into the browser, to like, actually transport over the internet and load into the browser. And then it's actually efficient to actually compile and create native code from just in time, create that, that native code and actually run. And um, if you've been following a lot of the industry stuff on JavaScript, this is a, the, the second part is a really big deal because we've worked really hard on bundle sizes, but parse times have become a really big deal. You, you might have a, you know, one megabyte of JavaScript code, and now you've got like maybe fast internet connection, so that's not a big deal. But the parse time on that JavaScript could be huge. It could be more, there could be more parse time than actual uh, downloading over the internet. So that's what we mean by efficient. WebAssembly aims to be fast to load over the internet and fast to actually parse for the browser. The second point of that, oh, so let me shoot by. The second point of that is that it's a low level bytecode. And as JavaScript people, we probably have had not a lot of interactions with what, what bytecode actually means. And so what I mean by a bytecode is that it's actual binary. The instructions, the data that you compile down to becomes an actual binary uh, file. So this is an example of one of those binary instructions. This is a hexadecimal of uh, the add instruction, an I, uh, int32 instruction. Uh, but you, at, you know, the goal of tooling is to, to make it so that you don't really need to know all of this stuff. If you've ever written things like Java or, or C Sharp, things like that, where they have bytecodes, ideally, you never have to worry about that. That's just an implementation detail. But uh, it is good to know because WebAssembly is early. The next part is that it's a compilation target. And, and what that means is that you mostly won't be writing WebAssembly by hand. And I say mostly just because if you are an early adopter right now, chances are you might have to get dirty with some WebAssembly here and there. And my talk's gonna cover some of that just to, to make things easier on you. But it's, as a long-term play, it's intended as basically it's an implementation detail. You really don't need to care how WebAssembly actually works under the hood. Um, but let's, let's take a look at, it, at a very simple example. This is actually C code, or C++, and really it's equivalent. Um, and if you've never written C, C++, hopefully this isn't too intimidating. Basically, it's JavaScript where there's a type annotation. You know, so, so, so hopefully, hopefully this is totally okay. <laughs> Didn't mean that to be funny, but I'm glad it is. Um, but with WebAssembly, this is, this, you could you would compile this C code to this binary data on the right. We'll circle back on that here in a bit. 
So WebAssembly is intended to be safe and portable, just like JavaScript is. And what we mean by that is if you've ever written C++ or C, maybe in college, maybe a previous job, um, you know that like, languages like that are, are just full of, of possible exploit vectors. You know, If you overrun the stack, you might be able to, to add executable code and then jump to it and things like that. With WebAssembly, you can't do that. Now, it's definitely possible for you to still overrun the stack. But you won't be able to, like a user could insert arbitrary uh, instructions and stuff like that in linear memory, but there's no way to actually jump to those in that linear memory. It's designed to be sandboxed and if and safe. So not only can you not overrun that linear memory and get into other segments that you don't, you shouldn't belong in, but you, you can't actually jump to an instruction inside some sort of textual, or excuse me, a binary linear memory. If you want to do what's called dynamic dispatch, those things have to be um, assigned into a separate uh, function table. And that's, that's a pretty advanced topic. But um, So it, it, it's also designed to be basically a shortcut to your JavaScript engine's optimizer. That's what Ben Smith, who's on the core team, um, describes it as. Uh, and, that, and that basically means that they get to, the browsers got to reuse their existing, existing virtual machines that they created for JavaScript, which is one of the main reasons that WebAssembly was even possible to begin with, because trying to get all of the browser vendors on board with something is a very difficult task. And there's been many false starts in the past. There's Asm.js and uh, Pnackle, which is like the, the Chrome side of things. Um, so finally, they were able to, to figure out a way where we can create a bytecode for the web that can utilize their existing virtual machine. But, but when, I, when I say this shortcut to your JavaScript engine's optimizer, a lot of people, the next question they'll ask is, well, well is this going to kill JavaScript then? Like, you know, are we basically going to always compile uh, in another language and, and go straight to WebAssembly and never use JavaScript? Well, the, the browser vendors are going to tell you no. That, that's, that's not, that's not the, the aim, and that's true. That's not the goal of WebAssembly. JavaScript has become a much better language in recent years, and I really do recommend it for a majority of people. But I will go on and say that uh, maybe it will somewhat decrease, or even maybe in the future significantly decrease, how many people choose to use JavaScript. So, and that's just because it's going to open up the ability to just have a whole new world of programming languages. Right now, if you've got languages like Dart and Reason and Elm, they compile to JavaScript, which isn't ideal because JavaScript was not intended as a compilation target. So your binaries are going to be larger. The compiler, the actual browser and the compiler, uh, the compiler and the browser is not going to be able to optimize it as well as, as a bytecode. But WebAssembly is going to enable that. So it's possible that something better will come along. Maybe Reason or Elm or, you know, heaven forbid, Dart is going to, you know, become the, 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 the new standard for the web. But that's, you know, it's, it's less certain and that's really not a stated goal. The next question that people are going to ask is, will I actually compile my JavaScript to WebAssembly, right? If I can shortcut straight to that optimizer, why wouldn't I do that? And the reason why that's not going to be True is because JavaScript is just too much of a dynamic language. It's extremely dynamic. You can do things that no compiler at, at ahead of time could, could uh, optimize at for. You can do really unsafe things. So compiling to JavaScript to WebAssembly would almost in every case be significantly slower. And, and if you really think about it, it makes sense, right? Because like your browser right now, it's going to compile, like, like V8, for example, does a, does a combination of, it starts to in, use an interpreter on your JavaScript, and while the interpreter is running, it's concurrently going to start jitting or just in time co compiling some of your code to native code. And then that, that approach is something that a, a ahead of time compilation just can't beat when it comes to JavaScript because of how dynamic it is. So the version one of M of WebAssembly, the MVP as they call it, um, is best suited for things like C, C++, Rust, languages that are traditionally ahead of time compiled to uh, native uh, assembly using things like LLVM. Um, but, but other languages are definitely a stated target. And being worked on, to, like support for these, these other languages is, is coming very soon. Things like Java, OCaml, um, Reason, Elm, all of these things are, are coming very soon. And to give you a kind of a little bit of a taste of that, there's, there's a, a language called TurboScript that was created specifically for WebAssembly. It only targets WebAssembly. And this is what it looks like. 
hopefully everyone in this room um, can, can read this fairly well, especially if you've used TypeScript, because it basically aims to use the exact same syntax of TypeScript. Um, it has some semantic differences, at least currently, because, like for example, you'll see you're seeing float, float 32s and there'd be i32s and stuff like that, um, which is something you don't have to worry about in JavaScript. Um, but, but the idea is to be very familiar syntactically, so that you could very easily either port your existing, some, some existing code to this, or uh, you know, write your, your uh, utility libraries and stuff like that in it. But there's um, you know, some, some caveats, which you can see at the bottom, when you, when you, when you allocate some memory, we're, we're creating this coordinates. Um, you have to explicitly call delete on it, which is like you know the same thing as like malloc and demalloc if you're if you're f uh, familiar with the C side of things. So when should I target WebAssembly? This is one of the more common questions I get, and right now the 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 real use case for it is things that are going to be heavily ba CPU bound, so number computations, utility libraries, things that don't actually interact with things like the DOM or don't require garbage collection which in, in a lot of non-trivial apps is, can sometimes be quite a few things. Um, the, the, the quintessential example is going to be games, which most of the people in this room probably don't do games, and I, I don't do games. Um, actually, <laughs> anecdotally, I, I uh, started doing programming in games. That's what got me into it, which probably many of you in this room as well. And then I quickly realized that making games doesn't mean playing games, and so it's a <laughs> making a game was, was not fun for me. But. Uh, <laughs> But you're, you'll likely be consuming WebAssembly either without even knowing it or you know, knowing it as well. Like you'll be consuming these binaries. And, and I'll give a couple examples. Like this is, the WebAssembly is very early, but there's already production use cases for it. One of those use cases is uh, source map support. Web, uh, Mozilla moved, they have a source map generation library that's used by a lot of different projects. Um, whether you know it or not, you probably are using it. Uh, under the hood, and uh, they, they ported that over from JavaScript to Rust, and that Rust gets compiled to WebAssembly, and they saw uh, an over five times uh, in, m improvement in speed, 5.89, um, which is huge, which is a very non-trivial improvement. And it's so early that this is going to just naturally increase. As browsers um, start to actually optimize WebAssembly itself, that'll just naturally get faster. There's been a lot of also experimentation in the JavaScript world. There's a, a port of the, the force uh, direction algorithm from D3 over to WebAssembly as well so that you can get that performance benefit because like D3, a lot of this stuff that it does is actually just algorithm stuff. It has nothing to do with the DOM whatsoever and that's stuff that you can move off into WebAssembly and get a huge burst, uh, boost in performance. But these other use cases are imminent and, and excuse me, I'll, I'll talk about those here, here in just a short bit. But so that we better understand what it is we're dealing with, what WebAssembly is, what it can do, let's, let's look back. And so let's look at what was that binary stuff that I was showing you earlier. Um, I showed that C, C function that gets compiled down to that WebAssembly. You know, if, if you're like me, like I look at this and I'm just like, ah, like, like I, I don't know what this means and how, you know, like how do I use this? Why do I care? How would I debug this? Binary can be a, just a little, quote unquote, timid, intimidating. So the, the pro tip I'm going to give you is don't worry about it. If, if you don't have a lot of experience with binary, don't get intimidated by that. Even today, even though it's so early, um, there's a lot you can do without needing to even touch actual binary data. Tooling aims to make this a non-issue. Um, right now, it's you know again since it's a little early, you might get some of the edges and might need to, to deal with a little bit more. But uh, yeah, so one of the things you can do is is the is use the textual representation of WebAssembly if you're needing to deal with the actual binary. And what that looks like is that that factorial function we had, which we compiled to WebAssembly, in the textual representation would look like this, which. Um, if you're, if you're not used to looking at like assembly languages and stuff like that, can be a little intimidating, right? You know, it can be like, um, I don't quite know what the heck this is, but, but let's break this down a little bit and actually learn the fundamentals of WebAssembly. Let's do that right now. So to understand WebAssembly, you have to understand that it's a stack machine language. Um, which differs from a traditional assembly language, which is typically called a register machine language. And so the question you might be asking is, well, what the heck is a stack machine? Like, <laughs> well, to understand what a stack machine is, we first need to really truly understand what a stack is. And a stack is a data structure in which you have two operations. You can push things onto the stack, and you can pop things onto the stack. 
And whether you've heard that terminology or not, I can almost guarantee everyone in this room has used a stack, even if you didn't know you were using a stack, because it's such a common data structure. But let's look at what I mean by that. So we've got a little, little uh, visualization that I created. We've got the stack, and we've got an item. Well, there's two operations we can do. We can push and pop. So let's go ahead and push that item onto the stack. Now, when we've got another item, basically, we have two, two possible operations we can do. We can either pop the existing item off the stack, or we can push this one onto the stack. When you push, things always go on top. When we've got another item, guess where it's going to go? It's going to go right on top. So we've created a stack, which, as you can imagine, like, like a stack of dishes or, or what have you, the, the analogy holds very true. The other operation was the pop. So if we want to pop something, it's always going to take from the top of the stack. You can't pop. I wouldn't be able to pop the item that's like all the way at the bottom while keeping everything else in place. It's always first in, last out order. So let's go ahead and pop these things off. Very nice. So last in, first out order. So I said it, said it opposite in the last slide. Um, so you, and, and basically, the last thing in is the first thing to get popped out, which is, I think, intu intuitive. So if we take this data structure and we apply it to the stack machine example, that means that basically a stack machine is instructions on that stack. We're, t we're taking instructions, putting them on the stack, and the machine is then going to pop those instructions off to evaluate them. So let's take a look at a very simple example of this, one plus two. In pretty much every programming language, this is how you do addition. In WebAssembly, they, they, the textual re representation is going to use something called mnemonics, which is just a fancy word for a textual word to represent that binary instruction so that you don't have to remember those binaries. Um, and this is the, the mnemonic for adding. This is a 32-bit integer, and we're going to use it for doing addition. And this is how you'd actually add that 1 plus 2. You can see here that we've got the, the, uh, the number 1, which is a 32-bit a, a integer constant, and a number 2, and then we're going to add them together. Let's look at how this actually would be evaluated by a stack machine. We, we've got the, the number 1, it gets pushed onto that stack. We've got the number 2, it gets pushed onto the stack. And then we push the add instruction onto the stack, which is going to pop off those first two instructions, add them together, and then place them back onto the stack, the results. So the result of those, those, uh, the 1 plus 2 is going to get put back on the stack automatically for you. That's what the add instruction does. Adds them together, places it back on the stack. If we wanted to do something then with that resulting value, that number three, we could do something like call. We could actually call the log function. So the log function is going to get called with that number three, the result of the previous instructions. Hopefully everyone's following so far. But when you're debugging your actual compiled, not handwritten WebAssembly, you're going to notice that compilers are going to apply optimizations. And so it can sometimes get a little hard to fully understand, like, hmm, what is going on here? And so I, like the simplest example, the one we were dealing with, uh, every compiler in the world is going to basically know, I can just turn that to three. Like, like that's a very simple thing. It knows that at compile time. Um, but, but I hope that gives you the idea of like some of the optimizations a compiler is going to do um, that can make it a little harder to grok. If the stack machine stuff is a little intimidating, because it can get really like hairy once you're, you're in a fairly, if you have a function body with a lot of instructions, it can get kind of confusing, because like a, uh, one instruction you're looking for could be way up higher on the stack. Uh, most tooling is going to use something called an abstract syntax tree syntax, which is a different way of visualizing the exact same data. And this makes it much easier for a human being, not a machine, because machines love stacks, um, much easier for a human being to actually in, uh, understand what this. So, so with this example, this 1 plus 2, add them together and call log, in the abstract syntax tree form, it would look like this. So here we can see a much more natural representation. We can see that the, the argument to call is the add, and the, the, argu the two arguments to add is those two 1 plus 2. So this becomes more natural. And instead of being just one long uh, series of statements, it becomes, you know, starts to drift more right with the nesting. And uh, actually, these are called S expressions. Is it anyone in the audience a Lisp user or who have ever used Lisp? Excellent. Wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, so that's, that's basically what these look like. They look very similar to Lisp, because Lisp invented S expressions uh, 60 years ago. So if you're familiar with Lisp, awesome. Yeah, I think you'll, it'll feel right at home. So this is all great. Hopefully, you now have a general basic understanding of what WebAssembly is. What exactly is missing right now, though? 
because it is early, I've said that several times, let's take a look at some of that stuff. And that's one of the more impo most important things, and, and a lot of reason why WebAssembly has not just skyrocketed in usage, is that it's missing direct access to the web APIs. And you, if, you, if you dive into the community, you might hear them talking about web IDL, which is the specification representation of, like the DOM specification representation of the APIs that are provided to the browser. And the reason why some people might say DOM APIs, but that's technically not correct, is because there's APIs that are actually don't interact with the DOM, like set timeout, set interval. Those are actually part of the quote unquote DOM specification, but are not actually part of the DOM. Um, so web IDL is what you might hear people refer to them as. But in WebAssembly, you can't access those directly. You can't call set timeout or set interval directly within WebAssembly. Instead, you have to call through JavaScript. There's a really fairly great foreign function interface, which is the how you call through WebAssembly into JavaScript. Um, and you would call some JavaScript code, which would then call the set timeout, set interval, or manipulate the DOM, append text, those type of things. Those things you can't do in WebAssembly directly, which is a, a big deal for, for a lot of uh, projects that don't deal with like algorithmic stuff. Um, but it's a very stated goal of WebAssembly to support these things. And there's proposals in the community group and working group that are working on adding these support right now. Like it's been actually in progress for many months and uh, very soon we will get that access. And it'll open up a huge number of opportunities for both the libraries and frameworks to do things for you transparently, automatically, but for you as well. A related thing that's missing is garbage collection. And it kind of comes hand in hand, right? If you created a DOM node within WebAssembly, well, you know, JavaScript objects are traditionally garbage collected. So if you created that in WebAssembly and you don't have access to the actual browser's garbage collection, how does it get collected, right? And what happens if you pass a DOM element from JavaScript to WebAssembly or vice versa? It needs to keep track of those, uh, those garbage roots and be able to collect them appropriately. It's necessary to deal with the JavaScript and the web IDL stuff. This, again, is also being exposed through WebAssembly. Um, it, it's going to have a, basically a very similar syntax to, to how the Java bytecode or the CLR bytecode works. You have, a, you have a concept of structs, and you'll be able to define the different fields. When I say you, I don't necessarily mean everyone in this room. Hopefully, tooling will make that obsolete and you, you know, just automatically do that for you behind the scenes. Um, the other thing that, that I'm personally very excited about is multi-threading. And when I say multi-threading, I mean true multi-threading, being able to create the equivalent of an actual p-thread, none of this message passing and serialization across things. And why this, is, why this is, hasn't been supported in JavaScript is fairly easy to understand. JavaScript has a very low barrier to entry. You don't need to know compilers. You don't need to know anything. You basically just create a text file with script tags. And inside that script tags, you can start writing JavaScript which is phenomenal. That's one of the biggest reasons JavaScript is so, so great. But because it's so easy, it's also so easy to shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> and if you, if you were given, given multi-threading, people would potentially significantly abuse this on traditional websites. They do multi-threading things because they heard multi-threading is great on things that don't, shouldn't be multi-threading, and they'd create deadlocks and lock up your main browser thread and stuff like that. So this is a very tough sub subject to add to the web browser, because you've got to be careful. But it is a stated goal that they want to support native actual multi-threading. And the idea behind that, like the number one reason why, is to be able to enable things like languages like Erlang, which have very unique concurrency needs. Um, which is going to require like, things like Go and all these things. Like being able to create those abstractions on top of those threads um, is going to be a huge benefit to advancing the web and being able to support all these different languages. And there's, there's actually many more specifications that are currently in progress. Um, and they're advancing very quickly, but I just don't have time to talk about all of them. But the, the goal is to basically make nearly any language be able to compile to WebAssembly. Since we're at a React Conf, let's talk about how is this going to actually impact React. Um, in, in the long term, what, WebSM, what uh, React could do is it actually could create a, a reconciler that gets compiled to WebAssembly. It could use, like, chances are, just because I, I know some of the, the React team, chances are they'll probably write it in OCaml or Reason. 
um, but they could use it in C++ or, or what have you. And the reconciler, uh, I don't know if there's going to be a talk later about the reconciler here at the conf, but the reconciler is basically just the thing that does the actual diffing of your virtual DOM nodes. When you render a component and there, it, then there was a previous rendering of that, it needs to diff and see what has actually changed. And with the new fiber architecture, it's a much more complicated. It actually re-implements um, its own virtual stack so that it can basically, in the middle of doing some sort of render, either pause or abort or do something else like that. This is a prime example of when we get garbage collection for WebAssembly, uh, Fiber would be a prime candidate for doing these sorts of things. And if you want to learn more about Fiber, there's like, so basically the idea of Fiber, you can pause then and come back to work later. You can uh, assign priorities with different things. So if you've got like an input box, like, I don't know if we'll be able to talk about this later, but if you've got like an input box and you're typing into that input box, how many of us have had to deal with the fact that like everything's slow now? Like when you're typing into the input box, each character that's added is super delayed. Like I've dealt with that so much. And in reality, all you really care about is making sure that input box is, is responsive. Anything else on the page is is usually second. Um, and that's what Fiber can enable us to do. It can prioritize that input box while bas basically being like, I don't care too much about everything else, so it can be rendered at a slower rate. Um, and it can also then reuse completed work that it's done. So if it's done previous renders, it can then reuse it. If you want to learn more about that, um, there's a really great talk by Lynn Clark called A Ca uh, Cartoon Intro to Fiber. And I'm going to give you guys a second, because I really think that if, if there isn't a uh, Fiber talk here, I really recommend taking a look at this talk, because it will really make it click for you about what Fiber really is. All right, so moving on. An example of like something that React could do something very similar, Ember has already is already basically ahead of the game in some respects. They have their Glimmer virtual machine, and they're actually, in the last six months, have been in the process of writing that in Rust, compiling that to WebAssembly. Now, it's a little different, not a little, it's actually there's some significant differences between how Glimmer works and how uh, React works, but some of the principles are the same, that um, you know they basically need to do some sort of diffing and, and uh, you know, figure out what changes they need to make to the actual DOM. But Ember is already basically trying to prove out whether with today's APIs, without even the garbage collection support, can they make this something that's actually faster than doing it in JavaScript? So it's, I think it's a little early to know whether this is actually going to pay off for them, but it's very exciting for me to watch and, and learn from what, what works, what doesn't work, things like that. Another thing that I think that a lot of people will end up doing is actually writing their React components in another language and compiling those to WebAssembly. Um, languages like Reason, which there's a talk, I know there is a talk uh, later today that's going to introduce Reason. Reason right now gets compiled to JavaScript, but they definitely, they're already uh, actually working um, behind the scenes to do some experimenting with compiling Reason to WebAssembly directly. It's, to be prime time, it's going to require that garbage collection support, but um, this is something that I think is will be a real thing. And like, I'll give a very quick example of what Reason looks like. Um, it looks has a very similar uh, syntax to JavaScript with a kind of a, a flavor of, of OCaml. Um, but this could potentially, you know, basically how your application runs and works, React actually doesn't care about. All it cares about is give me some virtual DOM, and then I will somehow diff that and apply it to the actual, um, the actual physical DOM. And um, so using another languages like Reason or Dart or what have you, or even a brand new language that has not yet come out, I think we're going to get an actual revolution of brand new languages um, here soon, uh, would be a very natural thing for, for WebAssembly. And it's, it's possible to do these things right now, but the missing direct access to the DOM, the missing garbage collection, those type of things, it does make it a little bit less of a, of a, of a compelling story. Because there is a cost to calling from WebAssembly to JavaScript if you have to keep doing that. And so like projects like Glimmer, what they're doing is they're batching up, they're creating like a change list and then sending that change list as binary over to JavaScript. JavaScript will then read that change list and apply it, which is a, a clever and efficient way of handling things. But so I think in the not too distant future, Instead of referring to React as React.js, I think we really should just continue to just refer to it as just plain old React, because I think React will end up being written in a totally different language other than JavaScript, and a lot of people will end up using it in a totally different th version than JavaScript, totally different language. So there is, a, in the not too distant future, we could be not using any JavaScript whatsoever and still writing React, which I think is wonderful. 
So how, how do I get started right now? It is early, but if you do, if this excites you like it excites me, how do I get started right now? Well, the first thing you should do is just go to webassembly.org because you'll learn about, it has great resources on the different toolings, the different uh, projects that are happening, the specifications, and uh, you're also welcome to get involved with the specification process. If this is compelling to you or your company, um, their community group is completely open to the public. You don't have to pay anything to get involved. You can, and if you want to, you could even just sit there and listen. They, they, most of the community group meetings are online through Google Hangouts. Um, if you want to really get down to the nitty gritty of WebAssembly, and that's where you want to start, there's projects like the WebAssembly Explorer, which is kind of like a JS bin type of thing where you can type C or C++ on the left, see what the actual WebAssembly output is, and you can actually even see the x86 out output from uh, Firefox, and there's a, little tap, there's a little toggle to also see the LLVMIR. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. It's probably not something that's interesting to you unless you're a compiler person. Um, Right now, the de facto way of dealing with WebAssembly for like the average like C++ uh, use case is going to be a project called mscripten, which actually is many, many years old because it was originally created for the Asm.js project by Mozilla. And uh, it's very similar to how you would use GCC. The API is almost identical. You pass in the files that you want to compile, and you'd get a resulting web page. And right now, because WebAssembly cannot, you cannot load a WebAssembly application without some sort of HTML or, and JavaScript, it does create you a, an HTML page. That's an optional thing. But in the future, you'll be able to load up a WebAssembly page without any corresponding JavaScript, no HTML, those type of things. Um, but currently, we're not quite there yet. If you want to go a little more high level and not deal with, and try and not deal with WebAssembly too much, um, their Webpack is actually adding first class support. This is a major, major thing for the JavaScript community. They actually got a $125,000 grant from the Mozilla Foundation, uh, Mozilla Open Source Foundation. I can't remember the actual. Um, what MOSS means, but um, th th this grant is explicitly to add that WebAssembly support to Webpack. And so what, what I mean by that is you'll be able to do things like this. You'll be able to import WebAssembly directly, and it just works. It figures out all of how, how things get added and linked together, and dealing with the complexities around sharing memory, uh, linear memory between different uh, WebAssembly modules. And uh, right now, this is how you, you can actually use this today if you're very venturous. You can actually, this syntax works today in, in, in uh, Webpack. But they want to also, this is asynchronous, they want to also support the synchronous use case as well, um, so that you don't have to you know, lear, load some sort of uh, external library just in time or something like that. And, as that support gets added more and more to, to Webpack, you're going to have things like a Rust loader, or a Reason loader, or a Dart loader, or some new language loader, so that basically you can write your, your, your Rust or your Reason right next to your JavaScript, and everything just works. You don't have to configure some crazy compiler tool chain or install things like that. It just loads automatically and links correctly to your JavaScript, which is, I think, once this stuff gets a little more stable, I think that's really what's going to help make uh, WebAssembly take off. Browser support is actually it's supported in every major browser today. So a, as of, of last year, it, it, the support was added to the, the last holdouts were Edge and Safari, but now it's supported in every major browser. And there are actually polyfills to be able to basically support. There's a couple different methods to supporting, like doing backwards compatibility, like if you need to support IE, IE11 or what have you. Um, one of the ways you can do that is at a compile time, you can generate a ASM.js version, which is basically a JavaScript version that the browser knows more about and can optimize around. Um, an alternative way of, of dealing with backwards compatibility is there's um, the community group ships a actual interpreter, which might sound like it doesn't perform well, but in practice actually performs really surprisingly well. Um, so that you'd ship the actual binary and then the binary interpreter, and um, it, gets, it would work in any browser, all the way back to you know, IE6. So, to, to kind of wrap things up, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk a little bit about this revolution and why it's a little, I think it's just beginning. Besides the garbage collection, the multi-threading and stuff like that, I think that WebAssembly, because it's so unprecedented, it's actually going to unlock a lot of opportunities that were never possible before. So like, let's go back to that, that, that definition I gave you, efficient, 
low-level bytecode for the web. I think we should strike this out, the, the, the last part out. I think we should just call it an efficient low-level bytecode because there are already people using and planning to use WebAssembly for cases that were not originally thought of. The, if you've heard of Ethereum with the whole, you know, the whole blockchain type of thing, Ethereum, their virtual machine, is actually being moved to use WebAssembly. So they'll run your, your Ethereum contracts in their, vir in their WebAssembly virtual machine. They have actually got a slight customization to the virtual machine for their because they have like a budgeting constraint that they have to do. Like your script can only run for a certain amount of time. Um, but aside from that, there, there's a, a lot of talk, not, not commitment yet, but there's a lot of talk about maybe the operating system supporting WebAssembly natively. Think about Android and iOS. They had to basically invent their own sandboxing mechanism because when you run a, a traditional native app, a, na a native app can do very malicious things by default. But on devices like iOS and Android, they knew from the very beginning they wanted to prevent a lot of those things from happening. And so they created their own sandboxing mechanism. But those sandboxing mechanisms are proprietary and not portable between different operating systems, not portable to the web. Um, and projects like Chrome OS have basically proven that, that Google and Apple and all these companies are, are very interested in figuring out how they can combine the web and the actual operating system itself. So I, I'm going to hedge a bet. If anyone here actually wants to bet me, I will bet several hundred dollars. I will, I'm not joking about that. That eventually WebAssembly will become the de facto binary format for applications in general. That you'll, the App Store on iOS or Android, you'll download your app and it will actually run in WebAssembly. Now, I'm not speaking for them so I don't want, to, don't want anyone angry with me for promising that to you. But I, I just feel so passionately about WebAssembly, and I see the writing on the wall, how this is going to um, be really great. So if this is interesting to you, I, I, um, I'll be available afterwards, and you guys are uh, more than welcome to talk, talk me up and ask me more complicated questions or specific use cases for your company and stuff like that. So I really appreciate your time. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter, it's at underscore Jay Phelps. Um, make sure you get the underscore, because uh, there's a, a, a teenager who who tweets uh, football and basketball stuff, and a lot of people at, like you know they add him and, and follow him, and so um, thank you very much, and <laughs> have a good day. Awesome. Thanks, Jay.